Then, 1 Peter. Therefore, putting aside all malice and guile, with hypocrisy, envy, and slander, let us be as newborn babes and long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord and coming to him as to the living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, then you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, there to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in our own scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall never be disappointed. For the precious value then is for you to believe, but for those who disbelieve, it is also written, the stone which they rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to those who disbelieve. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word of God, and to this doom they have been appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the very people of God. For you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So behold, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which will wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent, even amongst the Gentiles, so that the, in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, instead glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one who is in authority, or to the governors, or sent, uh, or as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right, you may silence the ignorant and the foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom, therefore, as a covering for evil, but use it as a bond slave of the Lord. Honor all men, and love the brotherhood. Fear God, and honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who seem unreasonable. For uh, this finds favor. If it is for the sake of conscience towards God, a man bears up under sorrows when he's suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if you do that which is right and suffer for it, then you have... Uh, and endure it with patience, then this finds great favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you the perfect example for you to follow in his steps. Who commit, he who committed no sin, nor was any defeat fa deceit found within his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering... He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to the Lord who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body upon the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by the, his wounds were, were we all healed. <clears throat> For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd who is the guardian of your souls. Do, do, do. What do you think about that? Do, 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 do. Not all at once now, I can't. Well, no. That's, that's more of a secondary kind of deal here. What is the primary emphasis? 
Oh my gosh. It'll be enough of the ones who are following God. Well, no. Preach by example. <laughs> all of that, you know, all of those things are partially right. But what's the first thing you see here? What's Peter trying to identify more than anything else? The followers of Jesus. Nope. How many of you here are human? How many of you are human? All. How do you know? <laughs> because I was born. Nine. Huh? Nine are human. Nine are human? Nine are human? There's only eight of us. Oh, she did it. Come on in here, Shirley. I'm sorry. So isn't it that he is preparing himself for his morning? No, 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 no. You know what? Is a cow human? It was born alive. Is a chicken human? It was born alive. How about a whale? A dolphin? A, well, plat a platypus. All born alive. But they're not human. How do you know? <laughs> Self-aware. Boom. That, that's a hit right out of the ballpark. Self-aware. That's what makes it, we call it a sentience. We are self-aware. We are aware not just of who we are or what we are, but we are aware of those around us, or at least we should be, unless you go shopping in the grocery store, then nobody's aware of nothing. But we are self-aware, and we consider things. Do I want to sit next to Barbara? Well, you know, she's a polite young lady, but she smells like beans. And <laughs> And I'll sit over here next to Raja, but I don't understand the dang word she's saying. So maybe I'll go back here and sit with Chuck, but you know. Why would I do that? We walk in a movie theater and all these seats everywhere and you know, look like, like one's better than another, right? <laughs> they all are about the same, let's face it. Way in the back, well I can see everything. Way in the front, I can't see anything. Open your eyes. What, what makes us do that? Because we're self-aware. Because we're self-aware. I walk into a restaurant with Carol. We're going to sit down and have a nice quiet dinner. And there's Shirley. She's a new mom with 12 babies. Mm -hmm. Am I going to ask for the table next to them? I've never met her. I've never met her 12 babies. But I know what babies do. And I know what moms do when babies do what babies do. So I'm going to say, uh, Garcon, can we sit over there or maybe up on the roof or <laughs> in a different county? Because I know what those babies are going to do. Now, is that any judgment upon Shirley, the new mom, or her 12 babies? Of course not. It's just I don't want to listen to babies scream the whole dang meal. And I can say that from experience because I had babies that screamed through the whole dang meal. And Caroline didn't go out, for, you know, until they were like 17 or 18 and stopped screaming. And now I have grandchildren that scream, so we're not going anywhere. The point is, the reason we make decisions like that is because we're self-aware. Are you a Republican or a Democrat? Ooh, politically self-aware. Now we're throwing ideologies around, aren't we? Conservative or progressive, man. You know? <gasps> Do you enjoy a good hamburger? Mm -hmm. Hey, soy boy. Got one of them tofu things you like to eat? What's the difference? Carnivore, vegavore. <laughs> you know, what's the difference? In fact, the matter is, I don't know either one of them. But see, I'm aware of ideologies. I'm a vegan. Well, I'm a, you know, vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian. I put lettuce, tomato on all my burgers. <laughs> and <sighs> sometimes our, our, our striving to become self-aware becomes a very hindrance from us ever growing or taking another step forward. You know what, I can give you an example of that. 
Tom Channer is a, oh, dare I say it, conservative. But then again, you know who's out there watching me? Woke people. Let me ask you a question. This is a biblical question. Listen to it carefully. What the hell is woke? <laughs> we are awake. No, 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 they're not. Quite the opposite. They're about as dumb as a bag of hammers. Well, I'm woke, so uh, we get to teach your kindergarten all about sex. My kindergartner doesn't need to know about sex. They don't even know what it is they're eating for lunch. <laughs> it's a nugget, you know, and, and they'll live on those for about 20 years before they realize what they are. But we're woke. Uh-huh. You're nuts is what you are. But all of that ties back to who we perceive ourselves as. Because we're self-aware. That's what makes us different from every other created being on the planet. You go, Tom, you're making a big deal of this. I'm really not. Because your self-awareness individually can guide you in many different directions. Or it may not guide you. Say, don't go that way. Don't go this way. Don't go that way. And many opportunities could possibly be lost based not so much on knowledge fully or understanding, but on prejudice even. I don't like that kind of food. I'm not going to that restaurant. Have you ever been to that restaurant? Of course not. Why? Because it's, you know, vegan. Well, you know, there's stuff you can eat that's pretty good. That's not necessarily got a cow laying on top of it. But see, self-awareness is prime. This whole chapter, Peter is talking about what? Self-awareness, if you want to use that term. Who are we as Christians? What does it mean? We can't identify what woke means. Well, can we identify what it means to be a Christian? Go ahead, give me the textbook answer. Well, I believe in Jesus Christ. He died for my sins and I get grace and I get to go to heaven for the rest of my life. That's like saying God is love. What does that mean? No man is an island. Well, no man's a pizza either, but that doesn't mean anything, does it? The point is, we've never, 90% of the beliefs that we believe in, supposedly, or at least adhere to, we've never really investigated why we believe in. Most, including Christians, have never even defined it. What does it mean for me to be a man of God? Wow, emphasis right here, maybe. I know what it means for me to be a pastor at First Covenant. I preach, I teach, I put up with people I don't like, I hang out, I do sports stuff with kids, I hug little big fuzzle wigglers that come up, I do all the stuff I'm supposed to do. I try and look nice, keep my hair cut short, I'm wearing a pink shirt. If that doesn't say pastor, I don't know what does. But is that who I am as a man of God? God, that being that created all things with a thing, single thought? Let there be Zachary. And there was on the 15 millionth day, Zachary. Let there be a Racha. When there in the middle of the Mediterranean, there, or not the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, <laughs> there came a Racha. <laughs> This is the power of that God. You know, let there be earths and galaxies by the billion. And there was. And it's incredible. Let the land be over here and the water be over there. And it was. And it was incredible. Let's light up the sky so everybody can see this stuff. And all the sun's ignited. That's what we're talking about when we're thinking of God. Let's make plants so unique and so tiny you need a microscope to see them 
And yet they're the most intricate flowers or blooms on the planet. You know, there's things like that. These guys study in their whole life through electron microscopes. Tiny little fascinating, incredible gardens that you and I will never see. Unless you watch the Science Channel. But they're there. For years, people were dying and nobody knew why. Until Louis figured out there's bacteria in that water. What's bacteria? Well, little wiggly things with eyes and googly things sticking out. Goes in your body and kills you. Well, what do we do about them? Boil them. Does that kill them? Yeah. Well, how do we get them out of the water once they're dead? You don't. You just drink them. Are you sure this is going to work? Louis Pasteur. I think it'll work, boys. What was that, Ben? 200 years ago, 300 years ago? And they found it because one guy said, something's killing everybody. And I don't know what it is. But he said, I'm going to figure it out. First and foremost, so it doesn't kill me. That's self-awareness or self-preservation either way. But so also I might be able to help another. Wow. That's a fascinating story about how he figured it out. All the people. He took a map of the whole city and he put a dot everywhere people were dying. And they were all dying everywhere around one pump at 32nd Street. And public pumps in those days. You didn't go out in your backyard and pump water. You went down to the public pump with your bucket, pumped it. You know, you're talking hundreds of years ago. But there was one spot over here. That's the lady he went to interview. And when she, he got there, her daughter was there. She, of course, had died. And the daughter said, well, we were back in the city the other day, and she just so missed that lovely sweet water from the 32nd Street pump that we got a big jar of it and brought it home so she could have it. Well, that's what killed her. And he knew. Here's the animal. I don't know what's in there, but something's in that water and it's killing people all over the place. He started testing the water, testing the water, I'm looking at the water microscopes, I'm like getting, you know, getting down, getting down, getting down, until finally he saw that little thing wiggling down there. Bacteria. That was what was killing him. That's what was killing everybody. And it was all coming out of this one pump. The city had lots of pumps. But this one had been infected somehow. Self-awareness, see? What is self-awareness? Well, first of all, it saves you, right? If you're aware that the bridge is about to fall down and it's a three million foot drop, what are you going to do? Stay off, Stay off of the bridge. Well, that's common sense, Tom. No, it's I don't want to die today. If two other people, children, were coming towards that bridge to use it, what would you tell them? Don't go. Hurry up, kids. Go, 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 go. go. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Not my fault. Isn't that what Christianity is all about, in a sense? Mm -hmm. Love God. Why do you love God? Well, because, firstly, you're aware of who you are. You're also aware of who God is. And then that translates itself into a living essence whereby others can benefit or not from it. Now, if this person says, No, thank you. And many people do when it comes to God and church and the whole religion thing. That's their choice. But you will have, as Ezekiel says, you will have delivered yourself by the fact that you presented the opportunity. Hey, the guy don't want to believe in God, doesn't want to come to church, doesn't want to do nothing. That's fine. 
but that doesn't relieve me from at least talking to them or approaching them about it. I'm dealing with that issue right now myself. Another couple I've been working on for quite a while. And, uh, you know, sometimes you go, oh, I'm so tired of dealing. Look at how long, how long do I have to deal with John Haley? And he's been here for what, 30 years now, 28 years? Present the opportunity. They can say no, thank you, and a lot of them do, and get more and more so today, at this day and age, because they're all woke. They don't need God. Which is stupid, because if they were woke, they would know about the two destinations. But they're not. They're not as woke as they think. You know, it's like Madame Curie, the fortune teller. She sees all things, knows all things, can tell the future. Well, tell her her skirt's unzipped. <laughs> she knows all things, but her undies are hanging out. Hey, lady. Or XYZ, that's how we said it as teachers to little children. XYZ, XYZ. What's that? Examine your zipper. Because most of them were down. <laughs> anyway, self aware. Now, of all the apostles, who was the least self aware? Peter. Why? Well, because he proved it over and over again. I'll fight with you to the death. Right? Mm -hmm. I'll follow you through thick and thin, high water, or doesn't matter. I'm Peter, the magnificent. Well, Peter, you're not magnificent. You won't follow me. You won't even face a challenge. In fact, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows. You'll swear and curse and three times and, and, and say you don't know who I am. Oh, Lord, I'd never do that on Peter. Well, what happened? He denied. he denied Christ three times and he went out and wept bitterly. Wow. What would make him weep bitterly? He became self-aware. For a few moments he did. Of all the apostles, only one betrayed him other than Judas. And Judas at least had the good sense to hang himself. <clears throat> Peter didn't just deny Christ like Judas did. He did it three times. He argued with people three times. Yeah, he was something. He was the one that always wanted to look, to leap before he looked. Drew his sword in the garden. That was smart. Got a thousand angry soldiers around you and you draw a sword? Kind of like the guy running out of the bank. He draws his weapon and there's a thousand police cars out there with rifles aimed at it. What do you think is going to ha happen there? Is that going to end well? Probably not. Probably not. Well, a self-aware individual would say, I've got one pistol, I just robbed a bank, there's a thousand cops out there with rifles looking at me. What should I probably not do? Pull a gun. Pull a gun. What should I not do before that? Run outside <laughs> and become a target. Because I can guarantee you it's not going to end well. Never does. You watch TV at all? <laughs> Self-aware. So many times we find ourselves apologizing. I'm really sorry, Barb. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings the other day. You know, I know you're the peach pie queen of the world. And I know I made fun of people who eat peach pie, and I shouldn't have done that. Just because I don't like peaches doesn't mean other people don't like me. But you see, if I were self-aware a little bit more, to the point of not just myself or my God, but of others, then I'd say, here's Barb, who loves to make peach pie. She's made them her whole life. Probably the best peach pie maker in the whole peach pie kingdom. And for me to consciously and purposely make peach jokes <laughs> and to condemn anybody who eats peach pie is going to inadvertently do what? Make you a peach pie. Well, it's going to hurt you. And what am I called not to do by this God? 
Don't hurt other people. Hurt other people. Don't lift your hand against them. Don't curse them. Don't spread false witness. And whatever you do, don't call them racha. <laughs> oh, God, I'm going to hell for that. <laughs> but if I go to hell on her time, I may never get there. <laughs> I'm going on island time, man. <laughs> anyway, I know I'm terrible. <laughs> The point is, self-awareness just isn't an internal one-way kind of who am I. It's a who am I, yes. Who am I in light of God? And who am I in light of Benny and Barb and Shirley and Raja and everybody? Who am I in, in terms of all you guys? That goes for a pastor, too. Who am I in terms of a pastor, you guys? Some people say, oh, Tom's a good pastor. He loves everybody. He loves the kids. He preaches pretty good, tells stupid stories. Others might say, well, this, he's a nut job. Well, you know what? They'd both be right. I am kind of nuts sometimes, and I don't care. I'm self-aware of it. And God told me to just share it, so I do. The point is, everything we do will ulti ultimately can be tied back to who we are. Who am I as a man of God? Who are you as a woman of God? You know, you say, well, isn't that the same? Not really. Let's face it, there's more things expected of women than guys sometimes, right? If you don't believe that, what society we've been living in in fact not you know it's a little less a little more permissive this day and age but let's go back to the 50s or the 40s women couldn't do this women couldn't do that when I was in high school in the 60s uh, 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 you didn't wear slacks to school no jeans no nothing you were in a dress lady every day and those nuns were right there to measure that sucker it was no higher than one inch above the knee well, when I was down there, they was like below the knee. It had to be below the knee. Well, they got them up over the knees by the time I was in high school. Men, you don't come sliding in here with a t-shirt that says eat more fungus or something. You wear a white button-down collar shirt with a dark tie and black pants or dark pants. Dark blue would be acceptable. I have looked like this since I was in grade school. All the way back to first grade when I went to St. Anthony. I never figured out who St. Anthony was. Some people say he's a saint of lost stuff. So if you lose your like phone. And your keys. Your keys. You pray to St. Anthony. Boy, what a day he must have. <laughs> oh, Lord, they lost their phone again. Hey, dummy, it's right over there where you left it. Your keys are in your back pocket. That would really suck to be St. Anthony. Another person says that he was the one that carried Jesus across the river as a baby. You ever hear that story? Mm -hmm. A poor peasant woman was holding a child and there was a river and it was deep and the current was fast and she was scared to cross it because she might lose the baby. So St. Anthony came along and put her on the shoulders and said, I'll take it across for you. And as he was going, the baby got heavier and heavier. And it just got to where by the, he could barely get through the current. And by the time he got to the other shore, it was just crushing him. Until he finally put his foot on the shore and then it turned back into a little baby. It was the weight of the world, the sins of the world that that child would have to carry. And St. Anthony felt that. So he was the patron saint of those who need strength in a time of temptation and brokenness. I like that better than the, you know, lost keys thing. <laughs> so you can go either way with St. Anthony. Uh, just old stories out of my self-awareness. But I look like this my whole life. People say, well, Tom, why don't you just wear a t-shirt like that today or, you know, pull over or something like that. You can preach. It's casual. Nobody will mind. That's not the point. See, I'm old school. I was trained up in the way a child should go, and when I'm old, I have not forgotten. You stand in the holy ground, the pulpit, the 
spokes place of God, you look the part. You dress decent. You look like a minister. You don't come in here looking like a hot dog salesman in front of Lowe's. Some people call it respect for the professional office. I call it respect for God the Father Almighty who created heaven, earth, and one more thing, Tom Channer. And then called Tom Channer to work for him as part of his holy temple. Am I the only preacher? No. Am I the holiest guy in that temple? Probably not. But I am a brick in that temple and I consider myself very privileged to have been there for the last 45 years. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power in my self-awareness. It is not, it is the power of God for salvation to anyone who would believe in it. Where'd you get all that crap, Tom? Studied it. Learned it. Lived it. Seen it. And now I believe it. Welcome to faith. And I try to help young men understand the same thing. Moms, frustrated moms, older ladies and gentlemen. I try and get them all to see that God is still the same, still right here. And where the heck is your skirt, young lady? I remember in high school, there was a great scandal in Cardinal Gibbons High School. All the girls would roll their skirts up. They'd get it up to about there. And of course, then when they sat down, it was... And then it was like their whole everything was hanging out. And it would drive those nuns crazy. And they'd get their thing out. No! they yanking their dress back down. And we got, the, boy, the guys got to watch this going, that's cool. I'm, you know, I'm going to roll my pants up tomorrow. See what they say. <laughs> They'll come in there and start yanking my pants down. <laughs> of course, that, I was in the principal's office most of my high school career. That's not a good thing, you guys. <laughs> anyway, the point is, this will guide us in everything we do whether you believe in Jesus, God, or Christianity what, at all. But if you do believe in Christianity, God, the Bible, the Word of God, if like Peter says, you've tasted the mercy and the love and the life of God, then you should also be applying that because you are no longer just a Joe Blow average nothing. You have become one of the holy bricks in the very temple of the Lord where all things eternal happen. And this is me, Tom. And this is Shirley. And this is Zach over here. And this is Chuck over here. And this, and that, and this, and that should all make a difference upon whom we are in every aspect of our being. Once we have tasted the heavenly mercy and filled with the Holy Spirit and made aware of the presence of God Almighty, that's not going to go away. For years I told Coach Wren, I can't run hurdles. I don't run hurdles. I, I run fast. I like fast races. Don't put bricks in the way. Well, we lost our hurdler. He broke his leg. Why? Because he couldn't run hurdles either. So he made me run those hurdles. And I worked on and worked on them. Knocked a million of them down. But I finally got to where I could fly over those things too. And you know what? We finally got another guy that could hurdle. And I said, let him do it. And I went back to my 440s. But I never forgot how to hurdle. And if we were out there practicing, you know, you warm up. It take about six, seven, eight laps to warm up before practice. If the hurdles were on the track, I would, I would jump them. <laughs> I'd come run around regular and then go boom, 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 and run back around because I knew I could. I knew I could do it. I never raced. Well, I did race once. I got third. I was never really good at the hurdles, but I could do it. Well, the same thing is true with this right here. 
once you experience God, the life of God, the mercy of God, then it should help you establish who you are in light of who God wants you to be. And that should transfer itself into everyone and everything around you. Welcome to Christianity. Welcome to faith. Welcome to, oh, dare I say it? Oh, don't make me say it. you're a baby, what do you need? Well, you need the pure milk of mom. You need the pure milk of the word, and he mentions that. But you don't stay there. I know very few 18, 19, 20-year-olds that still nurse. They give it up, and they start feeding themselves, and eventually they go to barbecues and help others and feed others. And that's the same thing in our physical life. It's the same thing in our spiritual life. This self-awareness must be like your body continually growing, continually focusing, continually sharpening to where you get more and more efficient at loving God and loving one another. Paul even says it in his letters many times. You should be teachers by now, professors. And here you are needing the pure milk of the Word again as babies, as infants. What's wrong with that? What have you been doing for 45 years? Oh, nothing. This is a joke that people have against Christians. You strap on a bib. You get to church, walk in the sanctuary, strap on a bib, sit down on the front row and say, feed me, feed me. When I was a pastor in my former denomination, that's all we ever heard. We need a minister. What kind do you want? Someone who will feed us, feed us. I got the perfect example of that right now, by the way. I have a little three-year-old grandson, Thompson, who you can't get anything down him. He just doesn't want to eat ever again. It's too much trouble. So that's fine. Just don't ever eat again. But then there's Lumberjack Luke. Lumberjack Luke is only one-year-old as opposed to three. He's bigger than the three-year-old. And his photo, we did a family photo, his photo is... He just <laughs> shove it in. He'll eat anything. You should eat, you know, chicken, broccoli, strained carrots, peas. He doesn't care. Shove it in. Sweet potato. The boy's already gone bad. Sweet potato. Don't feed him. He eats everything. You can shove a carburetor in there. He'd eat it somehow. Wow. Same mom, same dad, same everything. What's the difference? One knows what he wants, the other knows what he doesn't want. Even as young children, three years old and one year old, there is a degree of self-awareness. Even when they visit my house this past weekend, the weekend before this one, Luke would wake up, I got him a little one-year-old crib bed, not a crib, but a bed, next to Thompson's giant tractor bed, so they both sleep in the same room. He gets up, runs out, comes around, Open, he knows how to open the little doors, opens the door, comes in, and he goes, more, more. He doesn't speak much yet, but he goes, more, more. He's waking Carol up. She's got to get up and feed this thing. He's one, eight to eight, 12 months old. Who does that? He's an alien child or something. I don't know. And he's huge. He's going to be huge. Anybody that messes with me, I'm my Luke is coming. My boy Luke. You ever see Cool Hand Luke? That's who he's going to be. <laughs> Yesterday, my boy Luke come at me with a whole lot of nothing. <laughs> That's a whole other story. All right, this is what Peter's talking about in the second chapter. Why? Why? Ask yourself why, the interpretive question. Why would he write this? Why is this so important to him that we all know that who we are? Because he didn't know who he was. One thing he learned through that whole experience with Jesus, the ministry and everything else, is that he wasn't a very good disciple. 
he wasn't a very good apostle. He was supposed to be the leader of the church, and he was never the leader of the church. Why? He didn't know what being a leader of the church was. He didn't know what being a follower of Christ was. He didn't know anything. Now, just later in his life, just shortly before he would also be crucified and killed, he's trying to teach others, listen, don't do what I've done. I was never that good of an apostle. He's not saying that, but when you know his life and you know his work, and now you know what he's writing, it sounds like he's pretty good on paper, huh? You're going, ooh, wow, that guy's sharp. Well, you know what? Sometimes a bad example teaches you more than a good example. Sometimes a failure teaches you more than a victory. As George Carnegie often said, you know, failure is not your enemy. It's, it should be your tutor. When you fail at something, learn not to do it again. Learn to find a better way, a more successful way. Invest your energies a little more wisely, a little more cautiously, and whatever you do, don't make fun of large peach pies. You little peachy. She didn't hear me because her, turn, her things are turned off. Don't make fun of Barb's peach pies. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. Chapter 2 is all about this, but this is vitally important to the true understanding of the Christian man or woman. Uh, vitally important. It's actually vitally important to everybody, even though woke out there. This self-awareness. Vitally important. And this comes not from the heart of a man who is a stellar person at this. It comes from a man who is probably Jesus' biggest failure. Or biggest disappointment. Let me say it that way. And the reason he was disappointing is because he was not aware of who he was, who God was, who he needed to be in God in order that he might help others. So Pete never really did become the head of the church. James did. James, the brother of Jesus. Okay? That's chapter two. Thank you for coming next week. New Sunday school.